and perhaps we can open it up for questions. Yes? I've got about 20 questions. You want to uh, one question. <laughs> one question and one time. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you can choose the best of those 20 questions. <laughs> you mentioned the uh, percentage of CFS patients with XMRV, the percentage of non, I mean, of health with CMRV. Nobody knows what the percentage of people with MS or ALS or something. Well, how many of them have that? XMRV. Absolutely I, correct. Okay, then I don't see what, where, the specific, where the specificity is. I see that. Well, this would be the issue of XAND as a diagnostic classification. Let's say that when, you, uh, when the studies are done looking at MS, that half of people with MS have X, uh, XMRV. Well, obviously it's an important factor there. Uh, ALS, same thing. I, I heard uh, recently about some work that's being done there. We're just at the beginning of where this is going. And as you correctly point out, nobody knows at this point. But I think within six months, uh, we will know. One of the reasons I think that is uh, uh, Dr. Mikowitz had a meeting soon after her science paper was published and she had it at the Cleveland Clinic with Dr. Silverman and invited a retrovirologists to come and discuss some of the methods of the paper. And 76 retrovirologists showed up. They, they were impressed. They, they thought, hey, this is interesting. So uh, I don't think that this is going to just slide by and we'll never get to the answers. And that's happened in the past. I think that this we will come to know the answers. Yes? Would this be kind of etiologic in some cases of autism? We have like an epidemic of <coughs> autism, and I know it's come out uh, that uh, they try to test uh, kids with autism. I think one study I read was 40% turned up positive, maybe a higher percent. What do you, what do you think about it? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. I read the material on the WPI. A website that says that they had uh, three patients initially with uh, autism who tested positive. Autism is a very um, uh, interesting parallel because the immunology of autism is very similar to that of chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, young kids, we don't see chronic fatigue syndrome the same way we see it in adolescents. So, Yes, in retrospect, I can say, well, your illness may have started when you were three years old. But it could be that when you have uh, a more serious infection, that clinically it could be expressed in a disease such as autism. So uh, I don't know the answer to that, but it's very, very possible. Uh, Dr. Mikowitz gave a talk last week, I believe, to... Uh, the Defeat Autism Now group, and uh, I would imagine that that was taped and it may be on the web. So I, I haven't seen it, but uh, it may be that she addresses that question more specifically. Yes. Uh, I am an internist in Los Angeles, and I've seen Huntington patients more than 15 years, and I have not seen a single couple, or at best maybe one couple, with both properties of your Yes. So, how is it transmissible? Aha. I think that's a wonderful question. Uh, did everybody hear the question? Uh, he's an internist, and he's seen chronic fatigue for many years. We ought to get you up here. You give the next talk. Uh, <laughs> but um, he has not seen uh, cases where both husband and wife have it. Uh, and I agree, it doesn't happen. Um, so the normal way of retroviral transmission is blood-to-blood -blood transmission, uh, sexual transmission. And um, uh, this raises the question, well, if this is a sexually transmitted illness, how come we're not seeing it that way? Uh, that can't be the major way that it's uh, uh, transmitted. In my interest, I'm a pediatrician by training, and so the initial outbreak that we had was uh, 212 patients. Of them, 60 were children. And uh, this is exactly the same incidence that you see in community-wide outbreaks of 
what may be chronic fatigue syndrome that happened in the past. Uh, Iceland epidemic, 1,200 people got sick, uh, royal free illness. So whenever it happened in a community, you had about 60 kids and the rest were adults. Now, of the kids that I saw, they were pre-pubertal or just entering puberty. Um, the town that I work in is a small town. If there is some kid that's messing around in a hayloft someplace, everybody in town knows about that. So what I'm saying is that of the kids in my practice who came down with chronic fatigue syndrome, they did not get it by sexual transmission or by blood transfusion. How did they get it? I have no idea and uh, really don't know the answer. But the epidemiology does not look at all like this is a sexually transmitted illness. Uh, occasionally, I've seen a husband and wife both get sick with the same flu-like illness at the beginning. But I very rarely see a husband and wife who one gets sick three years after the other. I mean, I don't know if I've ever seen that. Uh, I'm not saying it couldn't happen because this is a, a common illness, but I agree this does not look like sexually transmitted illness. Well, I test uh, two patients by VIP, one test positive, um, and uh, I told him that I don't think it's uh, sexually transmitted because he's asked me about his partner and all of that, and he emailed me Dr. Paul Cheney's uh, email saying that it's in the saliva, it's in this and that, and he had it all over. So, uh, is it in the saliva? Don't know. Now, that's uh, the question is, is it in the saliva? I would imagine that it is. If you look at animal retroviral studies, it is transmitted by saliva in many animals. So, for example, feline leukemia disease from grooming in cats. Um, so, well, could it be transmitted by saliva? I would think theoretically possible, but it doesn't fit with the epidemiology. Again, the epidemiology looks really like an infectious uh, mono-like illness. Now the question is, is it a mono-like illness that, or is it, a, let's say, Epstein-Barr virus that triggers chronic fatigue syndrome on people who have no symptoms with underlying uh, XMRV? These are just questions that are there, and it'll be a while before they get answered. <coughs> yes? You made me change my mind about which was the most important question. But um, <laughs> is it possible that an XMRV or a similar type of retrovirus could actually infect another virus's cells, like an Epstein-Barr virus cell? Yes. Um, well, so an Epstein-Barr virus is a herpes virus, and it's a huge virus. Okay, it's, uh, if, if XMRV were uh, the size of this front row, herpes virus is the size of this room. Uh, back in 1987 or so, uh, George Miller showed that uh, herpes virus could carry uh, retroviral fragments. Now, uh, could it be that a uh, herpes virus could carry as a piggyback? Uh, I don't know retrovirology well enough to be able to answer that. So uh, it's one of the questions that I hope uh, will be looked at because, you know, for years we've been saying, you know, this fits with the epidemiology of mono. Uh, so maybe, but again, I just don't know the uh, science well enough to be able to answer that question. <coughs> 